everyone. Welcome to another episode of Triangle Be Well. I'm here in the Raleigh studio, the beautiful Raleigh studio of my producer, Amnon Nissan. Hello, Amnon. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. Very well. We've got uh, today. Today's not a good day to have no hair. It's a, sort of a cold rain, but it wasn't cold enough to wear a hat. So I, uh, I just went out and took, took the brunt of it. <laughs> so. I just cut it off. Okay. <laughs> So today, uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of things, but I'm going to start with um, type 2 diabetes. And we'll talk about why there's an epidemic of type 2 diabetes right now, not just in this country, but uh, around the world, pretty much anywhere where people have money. Uh, we're going to talk about what the current treatments are and what the dietary protocols are and why neither one is working and could possibly work. And we're gonna, we're gonna end by talking about a proven strategy for a pretty much 100% cure of type two diabetes. And the word cure is not one you're supposed to bandy about. Uh, you can't, if you say a cure on a pill bottle or a food box, the FDA will come after you. And there are people who would argue that what I'm gonna describe is not a real cure. Uh, because if you go back to the way you were doing things earlier, then your diabetes will return. And so we're going to talk about naming. And when is, when is something named a disease, or when is, is it not a disease? And after that, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some questions that I've gotten. And of course, if you're listening, watching right now, and you have questions or comments or suggestions or compliments or criticisms or dirty jokes, um, semi-dirty, type two dirty jokes. You can um, go on to the chat or you can call up. The number here is 919-518-9773. My eyes are darting left. I haven't quite memorized it yet. Or on Skype, computers, 2K voice. And K is just the letter K, the 11th letter of the alphabet, I believe. So that's Computers 2K Voice on Skype and 919-518-9773. Uh, you would make my day if you were a caller because you would be my first. And, and I always remember my first. So type 2 diabetes. So the first question is, is um, like, is this actually a disease? And if you might think, listen to that and think, well, of course, of course it's a disease. It's got a... It's got a name, it's got symptomology, it has a course of, of uh, progression. There are drugs that are used to treat it. Why wouldn't it be a disease? Well, so the history of medicine is kind of interesting. When you, when you look at the history of medicine, and it's something I recommend everybody doing, you don't have to become a scholar, you can just go and find books. Um, you can even go just to Wikipedia and look up individual diseases and look at their history over time. And what that does, when you take a historical perspective, you realize that what we have going on now is not necessarily universally normal. It's not the way things have always happened, the way things have always been done. So, for example, if you go back 115 years or so, 125 years, there is a very serious condition afflicting many people in Europe. It was called neurasthenia. Neuro, like neurons, like uh, nerves, and asthenia, like asthenia, uh, deficiency. So a, a, a nerve deficiency. And it was um, a recognized diagnosis. And the symptoms included uh, frequent fainting, sort of a, 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 a paleness to the skin, a dull, dull pallor. Um, and the interesting thing about this, this dreaded disease is that it really only afflicted upper-class women, and typically young women at that. And it was in the, written up in the medical journals, and there were treatments for it. And have you heard of neurasthenia? Has, has anyone uh, had a diagnosis of this in the past 100 years? No, it, it went away. It was not a disease so much as a social construct. It was um, young, young women with no purpose in life, no avenues for self-development, who were kept indoors, who were told that they were 
fragile. And one of the ways that you showed that you were a good, obedient member of this class was by doing what other obedient members of this class did, which was fainting a lot. So you would be shocked, you'd, be faint, you'd faint. They'd bring you the smelling salts, and they would, if it happened a lot, they would send you to take a cure, or go to a sanatorium, or you know, to avoid any sort of stress in your life. And it was, it was really a social construct designed to keep these young women in their place. It was sort of vulnerable, pretty, untouched by life, and the fainting was, it was almost like mass hypnosis. Like everyone agreed, well, if you have this disease, if you're diagnosed with this, then one of the things you do is faint a bunch. So taking that as an example, the question is, was, was that really a disease? Now, in those days, there were a lot of things that we have now that they didn't have. For example, they didn't have anorexia. They didn't have bulimia. They didn't even have adolescence. And by that, I don't mean that they didn't have people who exhibited those behaviors, but they didn't have names for them. They didn't have words for them. It wasn't, a re it wasn't considered a disease. And when you look at, let's say, the uh, psychiatric diagnostic and statistical manuals, you see how they have changed over time from the 1950s to now DSM-5 with hundreds and hundreds of separate diagnoses, including things like social anxiety diagnosis, um, orthorexia, which is the obsession with eating healthy food, um, even, even grief is now, if someone dies and you're grieving, even that has a, has a diagnosis to it. So you can see that the, the lines of what is a disease and what isn't a disease, what's simply symptoms or what's simply an adaptation or what's simply normal, uh, changes over time. And it changes based on those who are in power, who have the power to set the diagnoses. And it's largely influenced by the people who stand the most to gain and lose from those particular diagnoses. So what does all this have to do with type 2 diabetes? So diabetes simply means high blood sugar, very high blood sugar. The word, uh, is it Greek words, diabetes mellitus or mellitus, means dia is through, diabetes passing through, and mellitus, sweetness, sugar or honey. So, and this was one of the main symptoms that people, by which people recognized diabetes was a very, very sickly, sweet-smelling urine. People would go and they'd pee outside, and then they'd see all these ants rushing up to, uh, to lap it up to get the sugar uh, to, bring, to bring back to their, to their nests. So it means your blood sugar is very high. So the question is, um, what causes the blood sugar to be very high? And the answer is there's pretty much one thing that causes your blood sugar to be very high, and that is eating. In fact, that is why we eat from a physiological standpoint is to get calories in to raise our blood sugar. How do we know when we're hungry? Our blood sugar drops. It becomes low. It triggers hunger signals, and so we eat. So if diabetes simply means low blood sugar, then, or rather, sorry, high blood sugar, then why is that a disease? Why don't we just call that, I've just eaten? Oh, hello, you're suffering from, you've just eaten. Well, it's because in diabetes, the blood sugar elevates to a level that is too high, that is dangerously high over time, and it stays there. It doesn't come down naturally or normally the way it would if we were healthy, eating food, blood sugar spikes, and then over time, it comes back down until it reaches the point of the hunger drive kicking in again and saying, good, Time for some more food. So the question is not what causes the blood sugar to rise, is what causes these extreme elevations and the persistence. And to understand that, we have to do a little bit of biochemistry um, and understand a hormone called insulin. And insulin is a hormone produced in the pancreas, in the beta cells of the pancreas, that... Its job is to shuttle calories from the bloodstream into the cells. And here's my water. Thank you very much.
This is my fourth glass of the day, so I'm a little bit behind. It's almost uh, three o'clock here. I haven't had my, my six. Hmm. Extra good in the blue glass. Well. <laughs> so the pancreas but beta cells produce the insulin, and the insulin shuttles sugar inside of cells, and it shuttles fat inside of fat cells. And if we don't have insulin, then we don't gain weight. We don't absorb nutrients properly. Uh, the blood sugar can spike really, really high. And that's when we don't produce insulin, that's called type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is insulin insufficiency, either none or very little, not enough. And for those people, the discovery of insulin and its role and the, abil and the human ability to synthesize it were lifesavers, because those folks cannot survive without insulin. You have a second type of diabetes, of high blood sugar, which is known as type 2. And just another bit of historical lore, those names used to be childhood onset and adult onset diabetes. And in our current society, neither one, make, neither one of those statements of those names makes sense. So we're going to stick to type 1, insulin insufficiency, and type 2, insulin resistance. And what happens in type 2 diabetes is the body is producing enough insulin in some cases, it's overproducing insulin, but the insulin is simply not working efficiently. The insulin is not somehow taking the sugar and putting it into our cells for, uh, for use as energy. It's not taking the fat and putting it into our cells for storage, of long-term long energy storage. There's plenty of insulin floating around the body. It just is not able to do its job. So... The key to type 2 diabetes is understanding what's blocking the insulin from doing its job. What is, and that's why type 2 diabetes is also referred to as insulin resistance. There's insulin, but it's being resisted by the rest of the body. So that is really the key, understanding what causes the insulin resistance. And then when we understand what causes it, we can ask, is it reversible? Is it possible to reverse the insulin resistance? Or once you have it, are you stuck with it? So, for example, type 1 diabetes is, as far as we know currently, irreversible because the beta cells of the pancreas have been destroyed by an autoimmune response. And maybe we can talk at some point about what we think causes that autoimmune response. But there's no, there's no turning around. Right now, we don't have the ability to regrow pancreatic beta cells to synthesize new capabilities. So people who have type 1 diabetes are insulin dependent. They have to take a shot or a pump to just uh, manage to get the nutrients from the food, uh, specifically the caloric nutrients from food, into their bodies just so they have energy to function. Type 2 diabetics, the question is, can the insulin resistance be reversed? So before we get to that question, let us become bears. So let's do a little thought experiment. It's, uh, let's say it's September. It's the, the height of the harvest time. Have I talked about this? Okay, it must, must have been a dream. I now, I now dream about the studio. So it's the height of harvest time. Um... The berries are ripe on the bushes. The nuts are ripening on the trees and falling to the ground. And the salmon are plentiful in the stream. And you are a bear. And being a smart bear, smarter maybe than your average bear, you know that this is a good time to really load up on calories because, in the words of Game of Thrones, winter is coming. And when winter comes you are not going to be able to find food. In fact, you have decided or your ancestry or your DNA has decided a long time ago that the effort of trying to find food in the winter is calorically negative. 
you expend more calories out there in the cold snow searching for little bits of food than you could possibly find. So your strategy is not to go hunting or gathering in the winter. It's to hibernate, to go somewhere, find, make yourself a warm nest, and spend the winter doing as little as possible while your metabolism runs on life support and slowly burns off the calories that you've managed to accumulate during this rich fall season. So what are you going to do? You are going to, as a bear, you are going to go into pre-hibernation. And the goal of pre-hibernation, when there's a, a lot of food, is to store the right amount as fat. So you don't want to store too little because you might not make it through the winter. You want to put on some padding. You don't want to store too much because it's still September. You still have to be agile. You still have to be able to climb. If you become obese, then that's not good either. So your body is never extreme. Right? Human beings, our minds can be extreme and our approaches to things can be extreme. Our bodies are never extreme. Our bodies are always trying to optimize, to find the exact right place to be, to find the right percentage of hemoglobin A1C in the blood, to find exactly the right body temperature, to have the right um, bioflora in our guts. We're not trying to eliminate anything. We're not trying to maximize anything. We're trying to optimize and get everything in exactly the best proportion possible. So when we start loading up on all those calories, the insulin lets it all in and says, great, we've got, we've got sugars, we've got starches, and the, you know, the berries, those are going to fuel us right now. And then the salmon and the nuts and the fat is going to go into our fat cells, and that's going to give us our nice padding for the winter. So what's the problem? For the bear, there's no problem. October comes around, the berries are gone, the nuts are sparse, there's fewer and fewer salmon, there's less and less to eat, and by the time hibernation time comes around, the bear is sort of perfectly proportioned to the right amount of fat and goes and hibernates. Now, let's be humans again. And we don't hibernate, but we still have a, an evolutionary heritage that suggests it's probably a good idea to put on a few pounds in the late summer so that we could survive if there's a famine in the winter or a drought in the spring and the food doesn't start coming back soon enough. So being able to put on pounds in times of plenty is a really useful adaptation. And how useful is it? Well, we can see how useful it is by looking at how, how many people have that adaptation. How many people do you know who can eat the standard American diet and stay slim? All of those people have the adaptation that allows them to put on fat, to store fat efficiently in the presence of excess calories. So what we have in this, in this society, in this country, at this time in our history, is never-ending summer. Never-ending summer. You go out of the house, you go down the street, look, there's summer. There's calories available. It's low-hanging fruit everywhere. Imagine you've ever been in an orchard. And you walk out, it's magical, especially if you don't grow up on an orchard or on a farm. You go to a farm, you go to an orchard to pick your own place, and you go in the, in the harvest season, and you see the branches are bent low with the fruits and with the nuts. Right? And you can, see, you can smell them, the, 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 the smell of the ripening and some of the overripe fruit is, is heady. And you just walk into, you can go to one tree, and you can eat your fill of apricots or figs or apples or plums or peaches or oranges from one tree, from one branch, and you're full before you even make a dent, before anyone could even notice that you had been at that tree. I remember one time I went to a uh, pick-your-own-blueberry field. I was doing some consulting for the farm, and they had a, a pick-your-own, and they weren't, at that point, for financial reasons, they weren't an active farm, so they just had 
maybe two, 300 blueberry bushes. And I was there with a few other people, and we were going to be consulting with them. And they said, hey, why don't you go check out the farm, have some blueberries? Well, I love blueberries. Blueberries are one of my favorite foods. And there was maybe 10, 15 different varieties of bushes. And I just walked in, and I was like, you know, kid in a candy store times 10, because this candy was all free, <laughs> and it was all good for me, and it was all going to go to waste. There wasn't anyone else going to eat it. I mean, if I, if I could have, I would have come with, like, hefty bags and, and taken that all home. But I had 15 minutes in that orchard, in that, in that pick-your-own blueberry field. And I, I admit that I staggered in sick to my stomach because I could not help myself. It was so delicious. I really just overate way past the point of satiety. That's what our society is like all the time. 24-7 for most of us, for all of us who are not food insecure, and even for some of us who are, the calories that are available are the richest, ripest foods we could ever imagine. Not leaves, not the greens, not the roots, not the barks, but the fruits and the nuts. And why do we like fruit and nuts so much? Because they're high in calories. Fruit has lots of sugars in it, Nuts are, have lots of fat in them. And so if we're walking around worrying about starving in the winter and we see these basically Snickers bars on trees, we see nuts and fruit, or if you ever come across the occasional beehive, we will risk life and limb to get some of that honey because the sweetness and the fat tells us, ah, survival. It's not just, if you have a sweet tooth, it's not just, oh, I have no willpower. This is tens of thousands of years of evolution, millions of years of evolution telling you that if you like this stuff and you make an effort to find it, you will survive where others will perish. And yet, we have endless summer, never-ending summer. You walk down the street, I don't know what the closest uh, place you, is to here to get some food, there's probably a gas station down the road, um, it probably has a convenience store in it. And if you ever walk into the convenience store gas station, what do they sell? They sell energy. They sell energy for your car in the form of petrol and diesel or kerosene. And they sell energy for your body in terms of five-hour energy drinks, um, sugar, sugar. sugar drinks, um, you know, cookies, candy, fat, uh, danishes, pastries, hot dogs. Um, they are basically selling you summer on a stick. And that would be fine if we had it for two or three weeks a year, right? We could have our bacchanalias. We can have our celebrations where we have our cheat months, right? Where we can, uh, the harvest comes in, everyone eats like a can of queen. The trouble is when it's 24-7, our bodies are not equipped to handle it. And what happens when we subject our bodies to 24-7 summer is called type 2 diabetes. It's not a disease so much as an adaptation. And why do we need an adaptation? Why would our bodies say, after a certain point, there's too much fat in the cells now we're going to shut it down. Now we're going to stop insulin from being efficient. And when insulin is inefficient, it's indiscriminately inefficient. It stops shuttling the fat, or it's much, much harder to shovel the fat from the bloodstream into fat cells, and it's also much harder to move the sugars and starches from the bloodstream into the cells where they can be used and the storage into the liver uh, for glycogen. Everything stops working. Because the body says, okay, we are heavy enough. We have enough stored fat for the winter. So when obese diabetes is, is principally a disease of insulin resistance due to excess fat. So a visual here is if you've ever seen the videos of Japanese rush hour subway trains. And there's, you know, hundreds of people standing on the platform waiting for a single car. And the doors open, and everyone's very polite, of course, and they 
the people get off the, the station, and then people very politely walk into the car, and they keep going, and they keep going, and of course, it's diminishing returns. The more, the fuller the car is, the harder it is for the last people to get onto the train. So you may have seen the pictures of the people who are still on the platform literally pushing the people onto the train, trying to cram the, the train car full of people as full as possible. And what happens at a certain point is they give up because there's no more room for people on that train and they wait for the next one and they come in first and the people behind them become the pushers. And that's a pretty useful visual for why the sugars in our blood have trouble making it into the cells once the cells are full of fat, once they are full, rush hour is on, we've pushed as much as we can, and even the insulin is the thing that's sort of pushing in this metaphor. And it doesn't matter how many people you have. It doesn't matter if you have another 10,000 people pushing. At a certain point, they are going to become completely inefficient at pushing. And the cell is full of fat, and the insulin is just going to be wandering around, unable to influence the metabolism of sugar and fat anymore. So... High, blood, uh, sorry, high uh, blood sugar, as we said, is the hallmark of diabetes, but it's not the cause. It's a result. It's a symptom. And the real problem with the way we treat diabetes in this country is we confuse the symptom with the cause. So I don't know, um, you know what, what, were you, what are you told when... So you hear someone, someone's a diabetic. What's the dietary advice that we give to people with diabetes? What's the, diet, what's the advice that comes from the American Di Diabetic Association? What are, we, what are we told? We're told to watch your carbs, to, that sugar is the problem, that sugary drinks are the problem, that sodas are the problem, um, that potatoes are the problem, rice, especially white rice, corn, sweet potatoes, carrots, um, juices, anything with sugar is the problem. Because, right, the, the problem with diabetes is high blood sugar, so what we want to do is make sure we don't spike our blood sugar. We don't have any of those sugars. But as you can see, that does not address the problem. And especially if you're cutting down on sugars, there's, you know, there's, uh, if we're talking about plain white sugar, that you'll have, you know, that you can get at the baking aisle and put cups of it into food, uh, or you're talking about the sugars in sodas or the sugars in fruit juices, sort of simple sugars. Um, those are not health foods. Those are not foods that we should be eating in any sort of quantity. Um, for one thing, they'll rot our teeth. Uh, for another thing, they're so easy to digest that if you're trying to lose weight and you're having a lot of sugar, your body will never get to the fat burning because it's always got more sugar. It's, it's going to preferentially burn the sugar because it's, such, it's the most efficient fuel to burn. Fat takes, costs more to burn, and protein costs the most of all. So if you're eating a lot of sugar, you're not going to lose the weight, and as we'll see in a little bit, it's the weight that is the main issue around diabetes. It's the extra fat. So what happens when we take people and we put them on these low sugar diets? Well, we have to, low sugar means high something else. So if we're having, if we're saying not just sugars, but we're afraid of starches too, right? We, we, we hear about the glycemic index and we're afraid of rice and white potatoes and corn and pasta and, uh, and wheat and bread. And we're afraid of all those things because we're told that diabetes is a disease of high blood sugar and all these things will add to our high blood sugar. Then what are we eating instead? We're eating two other macronutrients. We're having protein and fat. And protein, high protein, high fat diets are actually the cause of diabetes. There have been a lot of studies done and I'll get, to, I'll get to a couple of them. But basically, sugar does not increase insulin resistance. In fact, in our neck of the woods here in the Triangle of North Carolina, 
one of the most famous slash infamous diet programs ever created cured type 2 diabetes with a combination of, wait for it, white rice and fruit juice. It was almost 100% simple carb diet. And this is, of course, the rice diet program started by Walter Kempner and has a lot of research backing behind it and years and years, and it's still going. You can still, you can still find it uh, on the web. And they've changed their protocols a little bit. But when it started out, it was called the rice diet, not because it was Dr. Rice, but because white rice was the treatment for type 2 diabetes with some added fruit juice. Fat and protein are what increase insulin resistance. So there have been enough studies of this that if doctors actually learned nutrition, there wouldn't be any question. So one of the studies was done in 1927 by a doctor named Shirley Sweeney. Shirley, at that, time, at that point, was a, a man's name. Dr. Shirley Sweeney um, compared the diets. He, he took two groups of people and gave one of them a very high carbohydrate diet and the other a very high fat diet. And the people on the high fat diet developed insulin resistance and diabetes. These studies were replicated and changed around a little bit by uh, Hemsworth, Hemsworth in the 1940s, who discovered the same thing. And then in the 70s, um, Dr. Uh, Rosell and his colleagues put people on 85% um, carbohydrate diets, so very high starch diets with a fair amount of sugar, and all of the markers of diabetes went down. These were people with, with mild type 2 diabetes who were essentially cured on a starch-slash-sugar diet. Doctors don't know about this research, and they follow typically the American Dietetic, Diabetic Association line on that the thing to do with people with type 2 diabetes is to control their carbs so they don't have these spikes. So the entire game of type 2 diabetes is blood sugar management. So this is like um, you now start getting paid your salary in pennies instead of checks. And depending on what kind of work you do, that could turn out to be quite a lot of pennies. And you're carrying around these pennies, and you, you carry sacks of them, and you're too big to get through the door. You're like Santa Claus with two sacks of presents, can't get through the chimney. And so the solution here is to take away some of your pennies. And we're going to now, so now we're going to do all these different things to make sure you have fewer pennies. But it wasn't, the, pro the problem was not the pennies. And arguably the pennies are good if you could just convert them into the right thing. If you could get them into the bank, if you could turn them into those uh, crisp hundreds, if you could turn them into stocks and bonds and uh, the the, uh, the ones and zeros that comprise our electronic banking system or into Bitcoin. I don't know. Are you into Bitcoin? No. No. I don't understand it yet. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how it works. Okay. <laughs> if I can put my hand on it, no. Okay, right. <laughs> so the problem is not the pennies. And, and, the, and the, the solution should not be to take away all your pennies. But that is how we think about diabetes management, is we're going to manage the part that we see, the, part, the symptom, as opposed to managing the root cause. And that's why I say that diabetes is an adaptation rather than a disease. So if you're, if you're walking down the street and you get hit by a car, you wouldn't call what happens to you a disease. You would, you know, you would uh, go into shock, you would start Bleeding, the body would release all sorts of stress chemicals to reduce your pain, uh, to clot the blood. Uh, you right, all sorts of things would happen. We wouldn't call those diseases. We would say this is the body doing the best it can to repair itself in an extremely stressful, dangerous, volatile situation. Well, if we went around, and let's say it wasn't getting hit by cars, but let's say we went around and our society developed a a habit 
of hitting ourselves over the head with hammers three times a day. We, everyone had a different hammer. Some, some people were lucky and they had like kids hammers from those like little tykes sets. And they, you know, some people would be unlucky and they would have, um, you know, giant mallets or ball peen hammers with very small ends on them. Most of us would just have the regular claw hammer and we would just walk around hitting ourselves a bunch. And people would develop, and if we assumed that was perfectly normal, right, people would develop um, diseases. We would call them diseases, right? Oh, this constant, what are the symptoms of this disease? Uh, well, constant headaches, blurred vision, um, nausea sometimes if I hit myself too hard. Right? And we would develop treatments for this, right? The first line of defense is, um, well, we would, we would ask people to wear helmets, so uh, we, would, we would manage their, uh, the impact they were receiving on their heads by giving them helmets. Maybe, maybe somebody would, uh, would kind of come up with a device that would um, you know, wrap around the end of the hammer that we used to hit ourselves with that would absorb some, some of the impact. Um, but in the meantime, no matter what it is, we're still getting worse and worse. And you know, maybe somebody would come up with like an extreme treatment and they would figure out a way to like break our elbow or to disable the tendons between the elbow, between the, uh, the humerus and the radius and the ulna. So we actually couldn't do it as hard or as often. We'd fatigue or maybe we would not be able to do it at all at a certain point. And they would say, well, this is the best we can do. There's no cure, but we can, we can certainly moderate the symptoms by um, preventing people from hitting themselves with the hand. So the solution, of course, is to stop hitting yourself with the hammer, is to put down the hammer. And all of those other measures, some of them might be benign, wearing the helmet, some of them might be um, useless, like trying to wrap gauze around the hammerhead. Some of them might be downright harmful. So if you can't bend your elbows, then maybe you, uh, you can't work or you can't brush your teeth and people start um, you know, developing tooth decay and, and periodontal disease. And we say, well, that's an inevitable consequence of the, um, the disease of uh, getting hit in the head by a hammer. So we have the dietary approach, which is to limit carbohydrates. It's in people, and if you go to the uh, Diabetic Association website, you'll see all these um, recipes which try to look like regular food, except they have very low carbs. So you'll, you'll and uh, no accident. The Diabetes Association is sponsored by Equal and Splenda and all the artificial sugar manufacturers. So you'll have lots of recipes that include artificial sweeteners and lots of recipes that will have you know, meat and some greens, but avoiding the carbs or, or just really measuring them very, very closely. Because if you have a potato, that's your, that's your exchange, that's your limit, because you don't want to raise your blood sugar too high. So we, have a, we have a question. We do. Ian says, why can't we get the two sides of the debate to agree on a research study to see who is right? Put mm -hmm. both of the theories about what causes diabetes to a test that they can all agree on as a good test? Great question. And he says, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to... Oh, I'm trying to find a way to bridge the gap, right? To get self-interest, interested financial rewards out of the issue. Yeah, well, you know, at some point, some someone is some genius billionaire, or genius who is going to become a billionaire is going to start an insurance company, and is going to pay for things that work, and they're going to pay for prenatal care, and they're going to pay for massage, and they're going to pay for nutritional counseling, and they're going to buy people food. <laughs> Instead of waiting until they get sick and then prescribing them the drugs, someone, some, somewhere, someone is hatching a model that's going to fundamentally change the way medicine is practiced. Because the way it's practiced now, it's worse than airlines. Right? Nobody, yeah, nobody is happy with the way medicine is practiced, including doctors and nurses, researchers. Uh, so that day, that day is coming. Now, in terms of if we're if we're looking just at type two diabetes. It gets a little bit complicated because you can cure type, if someone has type 2 diabetes, you can cure them 
with a paleo diet, with an Atkins diet. All you have to do to cure them is to get them to lose enough weight. You can cure them with bariatric surgery. Uh, there was, I saw a study that said about, about 80% of people who have bariatric surgery are cured of their diabetes after the surgery because their uh, ability to take in nutrients is so compromised to the, to the point where they're not diabetic anymore. Their blood sugar has normalized. Um, another way to get people to cure their diabetes is by getting cancer. And a lot of the chemotherapy drugs um, will poison you to the point where you can't eat so much or you do, you're not taking in nutrients properly, and then your diabetes will go away. So again, we're not, we're not necessarily just talking about the diet to reverse diabetes, because if you lose enough weight, you will pretty much guaranteed um, eliminate diabetes. Now, there's, there's complications in that the, med the medicines we give people for diabetes um, tend to make things worse. The, um, and again, we're talking about type 2, so if a type 1 diabetic needs insulin. Um, and some type 2 diabetics, if, it's, if their blood sugar really, really spikes hugely to 500, may want a little bit of insulin um, just, you know, just to not have to worry about extreme spikes over time. Uh, but when we're talking about, like, the, the real test is putting people head to head and having them eat a certain way over years and over decades to see which is the healthiest diet. And unfortunately, we can't really do that. There's a whole bunch of um, limitations to our ability to do that kind of science. We can't randomize people to two different diets, right? If you, we, can't, we can't take a, a million people and say, okay, half of you eat this way and half of you eat this way, and we'll check in and we'll do your, um, you know, your labs every so often, and you'll do self-reports on how you feel. And then we'll measure what diseases you get and what age you are when you die. And right, we can't do that study because people will not allow themselves to be randomized. People, uh, we'd have to, you know, sort of force feed them, uh, which is unethical. You can't put people in a study and then not let them, you know, do what they want to do. Um, when we do, sh we can put people in short-term studies. We can put people in a study for four weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks. And it's done. It's done with... Um, uh, the A to Z diet study had from Atkins to Zone A to Z plus the the Learn diet and the Ornish diet and they compared weight loss over um, a couple of months. The trouble with those diets is that we're only looking at biomarkers, um, which is to say we're looking at numbers that we think might be related to the disease progression, but we're not really sure. But we're, what we've done is we've taken a the drug trial model of research and applied it to diet. And it doesn't work. First of all, in drug trials, you always have a placebo, uh, or at least a standard of care that will be able to see. It's important for a drug trial that the people who are in the trial don't know which group they're in. Because placebo effect means that if you think you're doing something to make yourself better, you'll get better. And I'll talk about this a lot in uh, some upcoming episode. I have an interview scheduled with uh, one of the researchers who's done the most interesting work on placebos, Irving Kirsch from uh, Harvard. Um, and, you know, placebos, if you give someone a pill and tell them it's for a headache, their headache will get better. If it's a bigger pill, their headache will get better faster and more. If you tell them it's an expensive pill or if it's the right color or even better yet, give them an injection, the more you they think you're doing to them, the more people will trigger their own healing responses, both in terms of their perception and in terms of actual biomarkers. So it's really important to do placebo when you're doing a drug trial. I don't know any way to do placebo around dietary patterns. You can do placebo around certain reductionist elements. So there was an interesting study that was done about a year ago questioning whether people who, who reported being gluten insensitive were actually gluten insensitive. And if you're just giving people gluten, an isolated um, part of food, it wasn't too hard to take a bunch of people and give them a, a food that they, if you were told, had gluten and another food that didn't, and they didn't know which one they were having, and they were, they were told that uh, 
you know, it was all it was all gluten foods. And so they could see that people who declared themselves gluten insensitive or intolerant had the same symptoms when they were eating the non-gluten food because they believed they were going to have those symptoms. So the placebo is, is a really important um, part of human experience. I think it's underused as a treatment modality. We talked about this last time, I think, with the, uh, the psychiatrist who told me that uh, she used the SSRIs, the Prozacs, as placebos because that's the, all they were good for. Uh, but you know, to, do, to really do a randomized study and, and to be able to say, here's the proof we're looking for, it's really not possible. And, and it's, a, it's a pity because there is plenty of evidence that points to this being the very, be very best diet, a low-fat, low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet made up predominantly of unprocessed plant foods. No, there's no question when you look at the predominance of the research, when you look at the epidemiological research from around the world, where you look at lab studies, where you look at the clinical trials that have been done, when you look at longitudinal studies uh, in the United States and elsewhere, there's no question. Uh, so to, it's, almost, it's almost to say, you know, we, we want one study that will prove it. Um, it's, first of all, it's, it's impossible, and second of all, it's really, it's really not necessary. It's kind of a, a red herring that the paleo movement will, will bring up. And, we, when we, and we've seen um, over the past 20 years or so the food industry using the very same tactics that were pioneered by the tobacco industry to keep us confused. So, <clears throat> so far I've talked sort of scientifically about diabetes, but let's, let's come right down to what this means for you and me, which is if you want to prevent diabetes or if you want to reverse it, type 2 again, then the thing to do is to eat a low-fat, low-protein, high-carbohydrate, plant-based diet, eating lots of starches, and even some sugars would be okay. They do not contribute to uh, diabetes, which means Potatoes are fine, rice is fine, white rice is fine, white pasta is fine, all the things that we're told we should never eat. And again, there, now there are better alternatives to all of these. It's better to have whole grains than white flour. And one of the problems with sugar and flour is that they can be very addictive. And so if we're having a lot of sugar and flour in our foods, then they tend to keep company with a lot of fat, with lard, with butter, with um, processed oils. Right? So if you're going to get your, your, your Danish or your pastry or your pizza, some of the things that we think of as carbs, they're actually more fat than carbohydrate if you look at the labels. So this is, it's, it's not really under question that this is the diet that can eliminate the need for most medications. Um, because, you know, which raises the issue, why would we want to eliminate the medications? So there are, there's, you know, metformin, um, there are the sulfonylureas, there are various other um, new drugs. You know, diabetes has increased about 30% over the, over the past 10, 15 years. It's now about 14% of the U.S. population. So pharmaceutical companies can smell the market, and they're coming up with new drugs all the time. If you go on, you know, watch online TV or regular TV, you'll see lots and lots of ads for the latest smart drugs for glucose control, for blood sugar control. The interesting thing is that in all the studies in which people have tried to do <coughs> aggressive <coughs> blood sugar control to treat diabetes, the, um, the outcomes have been worse for the people who got the aggressive control. And by aggressive control, we're talking about basically 6 to 6.5% 6 of hemoglobin A1C. Um, I have it here. I can bring, bring up my little tablet. Uh, the website, thennt.com, uh, the, T-H-E, N-N-T, which stands for Number Needed to Treat. Um, they have, I don't know if this, this will show here. Oh, it's, no, it's got green screen. <laughs> so uh, I'll just tell you, tight glycemic control for type 2 diabetics over five years. So the benefits, we'll do this as percentages, um, 
How many? Zero percent were helped by preventing death. Zero percent were helped by preventing stroke. Zero percent were helped by preventing heart attack. Zero percent were helped by preventing kidney failure. So heart attack, kidney failure, and stroke are three of the main ways that diabetic, type 2 diabetics die. There was uh, one out of every 250 people was helped by preventing a limb amputation. So the total benefit was 0.4%. Uh, what about the harms? Over five years, 17.5% were harmed by severe hypoglycemia requiring hospitalization, which is to say we treat the blood sugar aggressively by lowering it. The real danger of diabetes is the crash. When the blood sugar gets low enough and you go into hypoglycemic shock, then what happens is your brain can go into coma and starve because your brain needs glucose as readily as our bodies need oxygen. It cannot be deprived. So the fainting, the coma, the um, low, you know, low glycemic uh, incidents can, can make you look like you're drunk, right? Uh, could pass out, faint. So that, and so over, over five years of this tight glycemic control, 17.5% or one out of six people had to be rushed to the hospital with severe hypoglycemia. Um, and that's over five years. If you, if you continue it over 10 years, the number doubles to 35%. Over one in three people from this protocol of these drugs. And there's, there's been no study in which these drugs have improved outcomes. So if you go to um, any of, if you look at the, the packet insert on the, on the drugs, you'll see all the studies that they've done that prove their safety and effectiveness are done over short periods of time and are looking at biomarkers. They're looking at the A1C levels. They're looking at um, fasting blood glucose. They're not looking at are people living longer and living healthier. And in fact, people are put on the meds and basically told to follow the American Diabetes Association diet, which, because it has so much fat and protein in it, is actually contributing to the insulin resistance. And so I don't know any diabetics who are on that path who are not getting worse, who are not having to up their meds, who are not having to add additional meds. The, you know, the doctors are now, the big thing is, um, you know, getting the perfect cocktail for the person. So we're, you know, we're, we're in an era of uh, genetic medicine and customizability so that the dream is that everyone, you know, that, yeah, there's side effects, but we can figure out exactly what's perfect for you. But still, the disease progresses. Yeah, um, Canuck Grunner mm. earlier said, doctors are partly to blame as enablers. I said, eat properly? Exercise? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's some more exogenous insulin. Yes. And ex exogenous meaning from, out out from outside the body. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I can blame doctors. I, it's, that's one of my favorite sports. I also have to remember... Um, that doctors are part of a system and that, that they're trained in that system. Um, they are not taught nutrition. They're taught how to cure or uh, manage disease with drugs. Uh, and I know many doctors who have come over to the light side, either from a personal scare or from a patient making a miraculous recovery that, they, that is unaccounted for in their, in their medical uh, textbooks and in case studies and being curious about it. So it's, you know, I think if you're a doctor, it's hard to be humble. I think you've been vaccinated against humility through your education. But I think it's certainly possible for doctors to recover. And, in fact, the, um, the lead author of the book that I contributed to that came out in October, Proteinaholic, Dr. Garth Davis, writes very powerfully and movingly about his own wake-up call, um, about his own discovery of mortality and the fact that medicine doesn't have the answers for the chronic lifestyle diseases. So I, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Canuck Runner, I guess uh, somebody, somebody up in Canada who exercises a lot. So it sounds, sounds like my, my type of person. Um, yeah, marathon, I'm, I'm looking at the feed. Yeah, that's yeah. Him. Um, Fellow marathoners who have uh, reversed type 2 diabetes, you drop the weight the insulin resistance goes away. Um, and, for, and, and 
people are different. So for every person, it'll be a different amount. Some people would need to drop a, t a lot of weight. Some people can just put on a little extra weight and become uh, susceptible to diabetes. So there is, there is individuality there. So I, I, I've got, I mean, personal experience. Mm -hmm. I, I was diagnosed over 10 years ago, type 2. Mm -hmm. And I slowly, slowly lost some weight. But it was real hard because I like to eat. Right. Uh, it got to the point where the doctor said, you know, there's something new called Bayeda. Uh -huh. Take that. That will keep it straight. The side effect of Bayeda was that you lose your appetite. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was, uh, that's why I stayed on it, because it was great. Now I don't eat much, and I started losing more weight. Mm -hmm. And I think after maybe two years of Bayeda, your your stomach actually uh, shrinks or something. I mean, you get used to not eating. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I'm off of that now, and I still don't eat much. Uh -huh. And at this point, I got off of that extra injection, whatever, and it is still good blood sugar. And I'm thinking now to get off the metformin, too, because, well, if I got off of the injection and it did not change my blood sugar, maybe I don't need to take the pills either. So the one thing about that Bayeda and maybe some others is that appetite control. Why can't they just come up with something that will control your appetite without the rest of the stuff? Right. Well, so a couple of points about that. Um, one is, so I would say for you, if you're eating less food, it's important to make sure you're eating high quality food. So you're getting, you know, the, nu the nutrients you need. Uh, so because when people have a bariatric surgery, one of the challenges is getting them nutrients. Uh, so you know, every, every bariatric surgeon will have their, uh, their preferred, you know, vitamin, mineral supplement provider because they're, um, they're they patient, they higher, higher concentrations. concentrations but yeah. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is that, you know, the weight loss industry, which is largely the appetite suppressant industry, has been working really hard to suppress our appetites. And, and, and the reason it doesn't work is that appetite is a natural drive. So we can suppress our appetite in the same way that, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I've had to pee now for about 10 minutes. But you know what? I'm fighting it. And... And I'm not going to pee until another, you know, another minute, and then I'm going to get up, and I'm going to run. But I'm able to um, override that, dri that urination drive because I'm sitting here on a live stream. But imagine if I tried to do it for another hour or two or six. And it's very important for you to um, overcome the pee drive. At, cer at a certain point, it wouldn't work. And why would I want to fight against... What's a nat you know, the drive exists because my bladder's full. So it's a natural thing. The urge to eat is a natural thing. And then to have a healthy appetite, to want to eat a lot, is a natural thing. And the solution to that is to move back to a diet that is compatible with human beings. So not a never ending summer diet. But, you know, so um, one of my teachers around diabetes is uh, Dr. John McDougall who um, routinely cures people of type 2 diabetes with dietary protocols. One of the things he does is he takes every type 2 diabetic off of all their meds when they start because the risks of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, are much greater. Um, and uh, train of thought. Now, now all I can think about is I've got to pee. <laughs> right, the, the drive. It will, so he'll tell, no, no, I'm strong. What? <laughs> Bladder of cast iron. No, stainless steel. So, but he'll, he'll take people to like a 10 or 12-day program, and he will have a buffet, and it will be a very low-fat buffet, but it will have rice, corn, beans, vegetables, soups, more food than people are used to eating. And he will encourage them. To, he will stand up and say, Mate, eat bigger plates, you know, get two plates. And there are, there are other doctors and people there who work at the program who will fill up like two huge plates, one with like salads and breads and the other with the, with the various uh, main dishes. And when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, 
and you are eating a very low fat version of it, so starch based, um, you can actually lose weight by eating as much as you want. You cannot fill your stomach to the point where you, 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 you get full, you get, like I was with the blueberries. I'm, I'm sure I didn't take in 200 calories, 300 calories of blueberries, maybe 500 calories of blueberries, but I was like, oh, I was so distended. Right? If I had, imagine if I had eaten that much cheese or hot dogs, I would have been like six, 7,000 calories. So I would say instead of trying to suppress appetites, let's get people back on uh, a na their natural taste buds to like the foods that are typically available and that support life and health. Easier so, said than done. Sure. <laughs> sure. But uh, who, what's life without a challenge? Yeah. All right. Well, it's uh, it's the end of the hour. I re I want to thank, um, oh man. <laughs> so Ken Canuck Runner, thank you for your comments and Ian. and Ian. and Ian, my first Ian. Thank you so much for your question. Um, if I didn't answer it properly, please pop another question or a note, and I'll uh, I'll do some research and try to have a uh, a more satisfactory answer for next time. Um, if you want to learn more about getting well. Um, about getting well, truly well, and not just managing your diseases, whether it's type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes or heart disease or housemaid's knee or hepatitis or anything, check out trianglebewell.com on the web. That's my um, practice website. Uh, stay tuned for, uh, for future shows. We'll be back uh, next week talking about some more stuff. If you have questions, you can go to Triangle Be Well and submit them as, as comments um, below this, uh, this episode, and I will, I'll answer all questions that come up. Uh, I want to thank Amnon again for your hospitality and your expert uh, producing. Thank, thank you. And I uh, will see you guys all next time, and as always, Happy New Year. Too. Happy New Year, right? It's a great time to uh, clean things up and be well, my friends. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan, My Life, My Will with Gisela DiCarlo, The Tanya Love Show, Help Then with Debbie Brock, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Triangle Be Well with Howard Jacobson, Lunch and Learn with Rabbi Yisrael Cutler, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, Parent Dome with Ryan Miller, Current Affairs with Amnon Nissan. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.